This particular Walmart did not have RV parking even during the day, but they did have a shared parking spot with a theater nearby that we were able to park at. Valk Hill is Eleanor Roosevelt's National Historic Site. It's where she lived after President Roosevelt died. This is the road in and there's plenty of RV parking in the back. Her stone cottage, there's also the Van Kill factory and a hike. On the way in we passed a painted turtle that must have came up from the creek. You can see why she'd like it back here. It's full of nature and beauty. Back of the stone cottage where Eleanor lived originally, the original house. And then this is the Van Kill building, which was a factory that she started. And when the factory closed, she then turned that into her final house. There's a hiking trail that you can take. Other side of the cottage. And there's where the pool was. The house where her and Franklin lived and shared is only less than a mile away. She decided not to go back to there. It was already a presidential library, so she came here instead. Pretty here, yeah, it's real pretty here. We're on our way to Franklin D. Roosevelt's library and estate. It's his long life home of the America's only fourth term president. It's also the site of his library and museum. There's bus and RV parking here. Bus to Franklin Roosevelt. This is part of the Berlin Wall, which they turned into a memorial for the Berlin Wall here at the Roosevelt estate. It was the first presidential library. This is the back side of the Rose Garden here. Here's the grave site of Franklin Roosevelt and Anna Eleanor Roosevelt. Coming up on Spring Wood. They actually launched his political career and everything from here. When he contracted polio, they took the trunk elevator that was already in the house and turned it into his own personal elevator. As you go around the side of the house, they have a screened-in porch area where him and Eleanor could sit and view the mountains in the surrounding area. You can take a tour of the house. However, the day we were there, there were so many school groups there that it was so busy, it would have took hours to wait in line to take a tour. Here was their view that they could see from the porch or from the benches out in the yard that they like to sit at, right there are the two branches. Hey, that's a coach house? That's a stable? You can go in the stable and walk around. You like horses, some of the ribbons. They went at different horse shows. A little tram, it's not running today. There's the stables. Must have a horse named Natoma. Nice metal work done. So we're back there called New Deal. This was a small ice house. And then it says that's a larger ice house. They had a large greenhouse here on the estate. One of the garden areas. It's spring, so it's planting season. Look, like they're planting sunflowers.
the Roosevelt's were very wealthy. Uh, the the state was very nice. He overseen the building of his own library. It was really neat. Uh, his house was beautiful. He was sitting, had a beautiful view with a portico out the back, and uh, right a lot of outbuildings like ice houses and things like that to see. Vanderbilt's. There's a nice path that you can walk around the Vanderbilt estate, including a garden, and you can walk around the mansion itself. It seems like a pretty nice wooded area that isn't overly hot. There was plenty of space for parking RVs in the parking lot. They had 13 children. Two died at a very young age that were boys, leaving 11 children. Out of that 11, there were two boys that survived. One of those two boys is who inherited the majority of the estate. It wasn't out of love or affection. That's just how it was done back then. And he was supposed to keep the estate going. We didn't get to do the Vanderbilt mansion tour. We missed it just barely. Normally we don't have a thick schedule. Uh, we try to keep it that we can just relax. That's why our name is No Worries. But today we actually do have a set schedule that we're trying to meet uh, because we bought tickets in Boston in two days. So we want to actually get to Boston in time to do our tickets. So so we're going to go on to Martin Van Burn Mansion and hopefully we'll make it in time to do the tour there. It'll all work out. No worries. This is a nice little country road from the Vendor Belt Mansion to Martin Van Buren's house. So somebody might want to know, well, how do we know we're not going to run into a bridge that's too short? We don't. We don't. <laughs> but what we're doing is I'm using the All Stay, Stay app. app, and on it, it shows bridges. So once the GPS tells us which way to go on the route, I then check it, that route, to see if there's any bridges that are 10 feet or shorter. So here's the little blue dot shows right where we are and currently there are no bridges I have the filter on to show bridges the Martin Van Buren National Historic Site the RV parking right next to where the school buses park right in the very front of the parking lot there were school tours that day however the volunteer worked us in between the two school tours and gave us a fantastic tour of the mansion this is the front of the estate, but they do not use the front door. They enter from the back or the side door of the house. This is the grand dining room, which is very elaborate for the time, and also why they don't use the front door to enter the house. Well, the second floor was like the living room, Mark Van Buren's room. If we get time, we'll get up there and see oh, Mark Van Buren's room. Um, and then the third floor was the servants. They had Irish servants who worked there. So they, the servants would have gone all the way to the third floor, and then Four and a half stories is up to the tower. So, this is the view looking up all four flights of stairs to the top. You're going to see portraits around the house of Martin, painted portraits, but people think that this is a really good likeness of him. And as you know, in the, the years before the Civil War, the antebellum period, South and North were starting to go their separate ways over that situation of slavery. But Martin was able, through various compromises, and their, they actually called him the little magician, because he was able to pull things off, keeping you know, um, the party together, and be, somehow magically, you know, but I mean, he really was a master politician. And he and Andrew Jackson, we'll talk a little about Jackson when we get into the parlor, um, he and Jackson were the really the founding fathers of the Democratic Party. Um, then also the other party in this political cartoon kind of gives you a snapshot. So Martin was elected in 1836. This is 1844. So Martin won for president, elected in 1836, defeated in 1840 due to that thing called the Panic of 1837, which was essentially the not knowing what would happen, but all his career he had been involved in one way or another, you know, he had slaves at his tavern that were, that was legal in New York, but then he worked to keep the nation together despite all of the happenings with, you know, the slavery in the South. And then on his deathbed, he's still, you know, hoping that keeping the union together was a very, very important thing for him. 
So. I was looking at the fishing hoops. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I want other. And the roads were bad. He was traveling in a stagecoach. And he got waylaid in a little town called Rochester, Illinois. Well, if you happen ever to go to Rochester, Illinois, um, you may um, see a giant silo. And on the side of the silo is a picture of Van Buren and Lincoln. So they met. What happened was the people of the town were like, oh my gosh, here we are. We have a former president. What do we do? How do we entertain him? And so they called in Abraham Lincoln to come and, and entertain Martin Van Buren. Where to go? visit, don't choose places that you already know everything about because then you don't learn anything and then you feel disappointed that you didn't learn anything. Choose places like this where you don't know anything about and then when you learn something you feel better. Yeah, it was really interesting because I didn't know anything about him. I mean, I knew he was the eighth president, but other than that, I didn't know any of the details. So it was a very interesting tour and, and our tour guide, uh, I thanked her. She did a great job. And it's free. It doesn't cost anything. So, uh, if you're in this area, it's great. One of the issues you may have is what we've had today, uh, running into some of the tours, is that New York school system is a little bit different, ex especially than Ohio's. So, they don't start school until after Labor Day. And they don't end school until June 30th. So, the month of June is field trip weeks. <laughs> So there was a lot of field trips at every one of the sites that we went to today. So it was very hard to get into a tour. I was really impressed with the National Park Service guides and volunteers there. They put together basically a tour for eight of us that showed up just impromptu. <coughs> showed us all through the house. Gave us really a better tour than we could have expected. Springfield Armory National Historic Site. Yeah, they all crane the lower side down. Used to be a loading dock. Look up there. See how the thing pulled it? Made the door. How's it work, Jonathan? It's a Blanchard lathe. So is this a model of that? Yep. Okay. That's a model of that one. So this is a model. So see that one. Your working slow. model. You see it actually moving. And then it makes the gun. See the gun right there? It would have just carved it out as it went back and forth. See, it would have made the shape of the metal or wood. In this case, it's metal. See how it goes up and down the gun mm -hmm. to make the shape. There, just shut off. That's, but that's the real size of it. This is the real McCoy here. Actually operates. So the wheels turn up here, come down here, and the lathe turns. This is the same model of gun that my grandfather had during the Spanish-American War. Yep, how far it traveled. So when it shot it there, it traveled that far into wood. So this was started in George Washington? He provided the funding for it. In the 18th Or he or provided, he passed the passed legislation. legislation to start funding for it. And it ran all the way up to 1968. Barrel straightening machine. So this was a signal belt, and for years it was, once it went off, 
it alerted the employees that water shops with the machinery was about to be powered up. The alarm was particularly important in the air of belt-driven equipment because an unknowing worker could easily be injured if the machine began suddenly to move and they weren't aware of it. So they would ring that one time and that meant all the belts were going to start moving. Carpenter's tool chest. This was a typical assortment of tools that might be found in the 19th century carpentry shop here. This cannon fired this round at a ship that was ran aground or something. And we have a rope and the sailors would climb down the rope to shore from the mass of the ship. It's estimated that this 1906 gun was responsible for saving approximately 4,500 lives. It remained in, produc in production until World War II, at the end of World War II is when it stopped. So this top one, it was actually lightning that caused that. Perspiration caused this? No. No. Salt, salt from the perspiration got in, and then a porcupine gnawed on it, trying to get the salt out. Yeah. Porcupine. And those are They're military handguns. Look, they will flint lock. I think you're supposed to start here and go around. Get there. Here. Look how long they are. Take you forever to get it pulled out. Although I've seen some that long. Yes. Yeah. And then get more modern. They don't look too lightweight to me. AR-10, AR-15, AR-15. AK-47. It's a SP. SP-1W. That's definitely not lightweight. And then here's the M-16. Then... Yep, M-85. M73 Some big guns So this is what the trench guns would have looked like A long rifle The muskets It's an organ. This was not an actual organ. It's just what they called the organ of guns. They also produce swords here at the Springfield Armory. So we asked to park in the uh, Walmart parking lot here in this town, and I'm going to put the name of the town and the site on the website. Uh, all stay says that you can stay here, but there's all these signs that say no parking at Walmart or truck parking. I don't even think they want you to park there to get groceries. But what they did tell us was we could park in the lot between them and the theater. And there is the Cinemax Theater next door. There's this lot between them. And they said it would be okay to park here in this parking lot. 
However, there are all kinds of signs everywhere that say no parking overnight. See it? No parking overnight. Violators will be towed at owner's expense. Here is where we parked overnight with no problems. And we also had another uh, camper van that parked here. As we parked there, we went over. There's a shop and stop grocery store. Bought some groceries there. And then we went on down to Marshall's. Shop there for a little bit. And then we actually went and seen a movie. Not tonight. Had supper in our camper. And uh, spent the night with no problems. No one we hope you enjoyed this video. And please give us a thumbs up if you haven't already subscribed. Subscribe!